the sandstone tower in the sky, the goldy fish the clocks that lie, the bells that peal with tuneful song, the steps we climbed one short one long. Cork in 1920 was an extremely volatile place. If you look at some of the old photographs from that time, you will see a lot of Union Jacks hanging from the buildings around the city centre. But don't let that fool you. Cox Merchant Princes at that time would have been mainly loyalists, but on the ground it was a Republican hotbed. The Cox Corporation was dominated by a majority of Republican councillors, and our own Irish culture was becoming more and more popular with the citizens. Housing conditions at that time were extremely poor, with large families sharing tiny rooms in tenement buildings, with little sanitation. Almost 9,000, or 11% of the population of the city inhabited these ill-suited dwellings. People started to resent the presence of the British rulers because of the brutality inflicted upon them. More and more young men and women were joining the Republican movement and taking up arms against the British. Your country needs you list a while Time for you to put aside Your worries and your fears The time has come to shed our chains Cast out your bull, take the reins We fight for Ireland's freedom With the Irish volunteers Guerrilla warfare was the method used by the volunteers to attack the British forces in Cox City and County. It was highly effective and caused great frustration to the British and inflicted serious damage to them, both physically and mentally. The IRA were having a lot of success in attacks on the British forces and as a consequence, a curfew was placed in the city. Any citizen found outside after the curfew without permission from the authorities could be shot on sight. In March 1920, the RIC entered the home of Thomas McCorton, Lord Mayor of Cork and Commanding Officer of the 1st Cork Battalion, IRA, and shot him dead. May the Lord above send down a dove with wings as sharp as razors to slash the throat to the black and tans that shot our brave Sinn Féiners. My own mother was a member of Common Man, and she told me many stories of how the women would carry weapons for the volunteers, provide safe houses, first aid and so forth, uh, before or after attacks on the enemy. In those days, women were less likely to be searched, so concealing weapons on their person was quite common for them. Oh, my name is Peg Duggan, and this is my story. I was born near Cork City, a town land just beyond. My sisters and I, Sarah, Bridget and Danny, we were early involved with common the man. From the time when they buried O'Donovan Rossa, our allegiance we swore to our own native land. The men folk did fight against abject oppression. The women supported at every command. After the brutal murder of Thomas McCorton, the IRA reorganised in Cox City and went on to inflict serious damage to the Crown forces in the city and county. To counter this, the British sent in the Black and Tans and the Auxiliary Forces to Ireland in an effort to bolster the RIC, who were being seriously depleted by mass resignations. Some of these men were officers from the army who had fought in the trenches of World War I. They were extremely brutal in the way they went about their business. The most notorious of all these auxiliaries were K Company, under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Latimer. In 1920, Cox City had a total of four Lord Mayors. Three of these were Republicans. After the murder of Thomas McCurtain, Terence McSweeney was elected. Max Meany was arrested on trumped-up charges and incarcerated, eventually, in Brixton Prison, London. He maintained a hunger strike protest and was followed by 11 more prisoners in Cork Jail. 
the first hunger striker to die was Michael Fitzgerald from Fermoy, County Cork. The next of these prisoners to die was Joseph Murphy, who died at the age of 24 in Cork Jail. Terence McSweeney died on the 25th of October, and Murphy died on the same night a few short hours later. Joe Murphy's death was overshadowed by the death of the second Lord Mayor in Cork. On a cold and grey October day in the year 1920, a funeral hearse approached the gates of St. Finbar's Cemetery. A thousand mourners walked behind upon the Terence McSweeney was one of Ireland's greatest patriots. Terence was married to Muriel Murphy, who was a member of the Murphy Brewing family in Cork. The loss of her husband in such terrible circumstances had a profound effect on her for the remainder of her life. Right through the summer of 1920, there were many attacks on the British in the city and county. The level of brutality also increased against the civilian population of Cox City and County. On the 28th of November, the IRA, led by Tom Barry, carried out an ambush near Kilmichael against the auxiliaries. Sixteen British were killed on that day. The same flying column would have another huge victory against the British forces at Cross Barry a few short months later, thereby inflicting the two biggest defeats on the British in the entire War of Independence. The Kilmichael ambush in particular had huge implications for the Republicans in Cork. The RIC, auxiliaries and black and tans went on the rampage through the city and county, murdering innocent civilians and looting businesses everywhere they could. I was born in Kilmichael, the county Kerry. Turn of the last century, my family soon brought me to live in West Cork, in the village of Ross Carberry. And my seventeenth year, I decided to see what the so called Great War was about. So I joined with the Tommies and packed up my bags, and to Mesopotamia went out. On December the 11th, the IRA received intelligence about two army trucks about to head down to Dillon's Cross on the north side of the city. They ambushed the trucks and 12 RA seamen were seriously wounded and one killed. This ambush, a few hundred yards from the Victoria Barracks, seemed to be the last straw for the British in Cork. They proceeded to burn as much as they could of the city. The orgy of violence started in Dillon's Cross area, where many of the houses were burnt down including the House of Brian Dillon, which stood as a symbol of patriotism to the citizens of Cork. They then advanced towards Cork City and threw incendiary bombs into as many shops and businesses as they could. The main target for destruction was the Cork City Hall. There had been several attempts to set fire to City Hall in previous days. This time, they were successful. Along with City Hall, the Carnegie Free Library was also set ablaze. While this was going on, the Cock Fire Brigade, under the command of Albert Hudson, tried valiantly to quench the fires, but were thwarted by the British forces, who shot at the firemen, and in some cases cut their water hoses. Despite this, Albert Hudson, an Englishman himself, was lauded by all for his valiant efforts and the efforts of the firefighters under his command. It is said, but for the Cock Fire Brigade's intervention, many more buildings would have been lost, and lives would certainly have been lost. It was incredible that on that night nobody lost their lives in the inferno, but in the early hours of the following morning, the RSC Oxys entered the home of the Delaney brothers of Dublin Hill and shot them both. Jeremiah died of his wounds within minutes, and Con died a week later in hospital. Jeremiah and Con Delaney had been members of the first cock brigade of the IRA, but had taken no part in the ambush at Dillon's Cross. 
I'll tell you of two patriots when life in Cork was dangerous. Pocan and Jar Delaney went in answer to the call. They went from playing GAA to fighting with the IRA. It's often said these brothers were the bravest of them all. Despite the awful carnage perpetrated by the British that night, there were also moments of humour. One story in particular was relayed by a member of the Cork Fire Brigade who told a story about a black and tan who approached him while dampening a building in Cook Street. This tan was drunk and apologised for the conduct of his countrymen. He proceeded to waltz along the street with the firemen. The years have passed and the beautiful city we see today is a fair cry from the war-torn ravaged bomb site of the past. Cork is a jewel among its peers in Europe, and it is right and fitting to remember the brave people who suffered terribly all those years ago. I leave you now with a rendition of the song that started proceedings. <laughs> Places far from home, from Perth to Brisbane, I did roam. Pick fruit near Melbourne, by the ton, was burned in Darwin's scorching sun. But often when I was alone, my mind turned back to thoughts of home. And the rebel city, so petite, a shandling steeple on Church Street. The sandstone tower in the sky, the goalie fish, the clocks that lie. The bells that peal with tuneful song, steps we climb, one short one. 